I'm sure in the next couple of years, in the next five to ten years, in fact, Nigerian population is no longer 200 million. From what they are releasing now, Nigerian population is about 206 million people. Praise God. 206 million people. God started with one Adam. And it has grown to 7 billion people. God always starts small. Amen. You see different nations emerging, coming forth, emerging. Coming forth, emerging. Hallelujah. So you see different nations coming forth, coming out, springing up. New babies are being born every day. And God only created Adam and Eve. It started small and it grew big. So, it is the method of God to start small. So, when if God is going to start a business now, following God's method, what is he going to do? If, if God has access to 100 billion, why does he pick the size of a monster seed? Now, let's go back to Matthew chapter 1 verse 5. So, the Bible says, And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come forth. Now, look at this. And not, and not the least among the princes of Judah. He did not even pick the biggest of princes in Judah. Praise God. So in Judah, there are several princes. And he said unto them in Bethlehem, for thou, okay, verse 6, verse 6. Verse 6. And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the princes of Judah. So, should we rephrase that? There are many princes in the land of Judah, but Bethlehem is the least. So why is it that God did not even pick the second to the biggest? So you now see that if God has 100 billion to start a business and 1 million to start a business, he's going to pick 1 million. Because God's method is always starting small. Gideon carried 32,000 people they want to go and fight. And God said, you know what? Reduce it to 300 people. And the Bible says, God will work with small number of people just like he will work with big number of people. But in the Bible, it has been very clear that God likes to operate with small number of people and grow the thing. Because in the growth process, there's a learning curve. There are many things that you meet there. And so when a man is praying, God bless me, I want to start a business. God bless me, I want to start a business. And God only provides 20,000 for you to start. He didn't give you 500 million to start. It's because there is more to that. And that's God's method. He makes you, he starts small. If God is going to start a business, he's going to start small. He's not going to start big. If God is going to start a family, he's going to start small. He's not going to start big. If God is going to start a church, he's going to start small. He's not going to start big. And we see that in the Bible. So Jesus, he was going to start a church. And he said, on this rock, I will build my church. And he only has 12 members that are following him all over the place. And then they grew. And they grew. And they grew. Praise God. Why is it that Jesus did not convert the 5,000 to his church member? Have you ever asked after that? Have you ever asked that question? He gave them fishes and he gave them bread. And the following day, they decided to come for service. Praise God. And when they came for service, the message on that day was not salvation message. It was tough. They said, we are going. He said, go away. The remaining member, are you still going to stay? They said, we will stay. Where are we going to go to? Nobody preach like you preach. Praise God. 
So is is God is always interested in starting small. So don't be ashamed to start small. See, does God not have power to make a tree just grow big all of a sudden? Does he not have power? Does he not have power to make a child to be born in one day and that child will become a man in one day and will be married in one day? No, answer me, answer me. But why is it that he does not do that? The simple reason is because when he created Adam in the Garden of Eden, Adam was around 30 years old. If we are going to use Bible to interpret Bible, Adam should be around 30 years old. Amen. Now, Adam was created in the Garden of Eden. He was not born by anybody. He did not go through any process. How easy was it for him to fall? It was very easy for him to fall. And then the Bible told us about the last Adam, which was Jesus Christ. He was born in a manger. I don't know whether someone is seeing what I'm saying. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Because some people are looking at me and say, Hey, is this pastor preaching false doctrine? Praise God. <laughs> so let's look at it. Okay. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 45. What does the Bible say there? The Bible says, So it is written, The first Adam, the first man Adam was made a what? A living soul. The last man Adam was made a what? Okay, so now look at this. The first man Adam. When you are first, what's supposed to follow? Second. But the Bible did not say second. The last man, Adam. Because that's talking about pattern. Pattern. So that's the last type of Adam you will ever have. So the first type of Adam was just created. Boom. He just found himself in the Garden of Eden. And he saw Apple. Ah! Apple. What, what, is that not what the Bible says? Okay, maybe some people have forgotten. Maybe we should go back to the Bible. Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. Sorry, chapter 1. And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the over the cattle, and over all the head, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Okay? Uh, let's go now to chapter 2. Verse, verse, uh, okay, let me read from verse 4, chapter 2, verse 4. These are the generation of heavens and the earth when they were created. In the day the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, and every plant of the feet before it was in the earth, and every herb of the feet before it grew for the Lord God. And not cause it to rain upon the head, and there was not a man to till the head, the ground. But there went up a mist from the head, and watered the whole face of the ground. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. The Lord God did what? Talk to me, talk to me. The Lord God did what? Okay. So, what? What what happened next? And man become a what? So that was how Adam came about. But the last Adam, who gave birth to the last Adam? The first Adam, does he fall or did he not fall? The same test that the first Adam faced, it happened. The last Adam faced it. Turn this stone to praise God. So God 
has developed a system of always starting small. So when you see a a church start small, are you getting me now? That's the method of God. When you see a pastor start church and that the the whole place was filled up that is either of two things. It's either it's a branch of a church or the pastor took all the member from somewhere. <laughs> Praise God. If it is God's church, it must start small. Because even Jesus that you are following started what? So don't be ashamed to start small. You want to start your business. You want to start your life. You need Some people want to have their wedding. And they want to do it big. When they don't have the money, don't kill yourself. Turn to somebody and say, don't kill yourself. You know, the son or the daughter of one governor recently make a four million era kick. That's what some people will be pursuing. They say, if it is cut cake that you can make, make it and let them eat and go. Praise God. If pastor join you together, let them come and dissolve you. Because you give them cut cake. You know, some people will just put themselves into a necessary problem. Because of what other people are doing. Start your life small. Some people want to marry a brother that has built three-story building, have a car, is working in Chevron. It's good. It's good. But what of if you don't get that brother? And the only brother you get is the brother that has a vision of where he's going to. <laughs> he does not have a television. <laughs> Praise God. You have to understand that starting small is a method of God. You start small and then you start growing and growing and growing. If it's a small room apartment you want to start with, you start small and then grow and grow. Don't be ashamed to start small. It's the method of God. Praise God. So when you now start small, how do you grow big? Amen. So let's look at uh, Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12. When you start small under God's method, how do you grow big? Now, I need you to understand that everything that God can give you, physical thing that God can give you, that people will look at and say you are big, the same thing the devil can also give you. So you have to decide who you are getting your own from. Praise God. Everything that you can get in life, people will look at you and say, ah, that guy is big. The devil can also give you. And the devil can give a man that thing and is covering up with God. He say, ah, it's God that gave me. Meanwhile, it's the devil. So it's possible. So you have to decide where you are getting it from. Anything you get from the devil will land you in hell. You can't escape. What shall a man gain if he has the whole world and lose his own soul. What shall a man give in exchange for his soul? So look at Genesis chapter 12. What does the Bible say there? Verse 1. Now the Lord has said unto Abraham, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land which I will show thee. Verse 2. I will make of thee a great nation. I will bless thee. I will make thy name great. And thou shalt be a blessing. That's what he said. Okay? So, did that happen to Abraham? Yes, it happened. Genesis chapter 24. Verse 1 again. And Abraham, can you see that the name Abraham 
and Abraham in chapter 12, verse 1, and chapter 24, verse 1, they are different. Look at it. Look at your Bible. Look at your Bible. Look at your Bible. Look at your Bible. So look at this. Please, can you spell this Abraham for me, everybody? So let's go back to chapter 12, verse 1, sir. Chapter 12, verse 1. Spell this Abraham. Hab and Ram. Isn't it? So let's go back to chapter 24, verse 1. Chapter 24, verse 1. So you see that it has changed. Even the name changed. And Abraham was old and went stricken in age. And the Lord has blessed Abraham. In how many things? You are going to increase. In the name of Jesus. I don't care where you are coming from now. But there is a blessing of increase on your life. You will expand to the right. You will expand to the left. You will expand to the front. You will expand on every side. In the name of Jesus. And Abraham was old. And well stricken in age. If he had a passport in chapter 12. And he wants to travel in chapter 24. They will deny him. Visa. Because his records are not consistent. Men generally want you to just be the same. But you serve a God that can change your story. Your story will change you. I say your story will change. In the name of Jesus. No matter your background, your testimony will be mightier. You may be small today, you are becoming big. In the name of Jesus. God will work things out in your favor. I know that some of you are confused now because you don't even have enough money. God will work things out in your favor. He will establish your life. He will stabilize you in life. He will increase you on every side. In the name of Jesus. So the Bible says in verse 24, God has blessed Abraham in all things. And you remember what the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 22. The blessing of the Lord make it rich. So when you are blessed, you will be rich. The blessing of the Lord make it You cannot get your riches through God and you will not be blessed. It doesn't work that way. And so God has blessed Abraham in all things. And if we look at that scripture very well, in verse verse 2, Abraham said unto his eldest servant of his house that ruled over all that he had, I pray thee that thy hand be on my tie, and I will make thee swear the Lord by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of the head, thou shalt take a wife unto my son of the daughter of the Canaanite, among whom I dwell. Now, what am I trying to say? He's now thinking of expansion. So, but what was the method that God used to raise Abraham from chapter 12 to chapter 22? And this was the same method God has always been using. So, let's go back to Genesis chapter 12. What does the Bible say in verse, uh, okay, let's leave that. Let's leave that. Let's come over to, let's go over to chapter 16. I think I want us to do chapter 16. Okay. Sorry about that. We're supposed to. We're supposed to pull a verse, verse, chapter 13. Okay, beautiful. So let's go back now to chapter 13, verse 14. The Bible says there, And the Lord said unto Abraham, after Lot was separated from him. I wanted to bring out something before Lot was separated from Abraham. 
I wanted to bring out something. Before Lot was separated from Abraham, Abraham built an altar unto the Lord. Okay? Before Lot was separated from Abraham, Lot never built a single altar. So let's look at verse 7. Genesis chapter 12 verse 7. And the Lord appeared unto Abraham and said to, and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And there builded he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. Now, if you look at the man Lord, the man Lord was related to Abraham. May you obtain mercy. In the name of Jesus. There were three people in the lineage of Abraham. And God brought out Abraham. Now let me give you a background history. The, the men generally want to be doing things without God. They don't want all this miracle stuff. It was God that did it for me. They don't want to be adding that to what they say. That was what men want to be doing. So they, and when they were building that tower, they got to a point, God came down, and, and that's the power of unity. Whenever unity is anywhere, it will catch God's attention. And that's why the Holy Ghost comes down when they were in one place with one accord. Wherever there is unity, it attracts the attention of God. Because when people, okay, look at the last protest. When people are united, when police shoot at them, they approach the police. The police ran away, isn't it? Even Hami ran away. I saw the video that Hami ran away. Because the people were united. There's a lot of things that comes with unity. So, they were united. They were building. And as they were building, God came down and he gave them different languages. And that's why today you see us speaking English. Somebody speaking Hausa language. Somebody speaking Yoruba language. Somebody speaking Spanish language. Somebody speaking French. That was where it started from. Amen. And when that happened, what eventually followed was that God now wanted to start his own nature. Men were trying to do their thing. And when God cut that short, he wanted the head to be filled. With his own thing. Amen. Amen. So he was looking for a man. You know I told you. Whenever God wants to make a move. He gets a man. So he was looking for a man. So in the family line of Abraham. All of them were herbalists. He checked their hearts. And when he checked their hearts. Abraham was the guy that God was going to pick. And when God picked Abraham. One of the three of the people. That was with Abraham. Maybe we should just check that in chapter 12. Chapter 11, sorry. Chapter 11. Can we quickly go see that? Chapter 11. Okay. Chapter 11, verse 26. And Terah lived 70 years and begat Abraham, Nahor, and Aaron. So, you look at it. Now, these are the generation of Terah. Terah begat Abraham, Nahor and Aaron, and Aaron began Lot. So Lot was the son of Haran. Praise God. So I, along the line, Lot has to go with Abraham. God said, come out. Go to where I will tell you to go to. I want to create a great nation out of you. And Lot is brother's son. What do we call that? Is it nephew or cousin or nephew, right? He was going with him. So, Lot was his uncle. Isn't he? And then he was going with Lot. I mean, he was going with Abraham. And then look at, look at chapter 12. God gave a promise to Abraham and Abraham built an altar unto God. And when that happened, look at chapter 13. And Abraham went up Chapter 13, verse 1. And Abraham went up out of Egypt, he and his wife, and all he had, and Lot with him into the south. And Abraham was very rich in cattle, in silver, and in gold. So God blessed Abraham, and that blessing rubbed off on Lot. That is to say, there are some people that the blessing of God is upon their life, when you walk with them, the blessing can rub off on you. 
when you stay away, the blessing dries up. You have to understand that there are people that God will plant in your life like that. Hallelujah. Everyone in your life does not come in there by accident. So, Lord, stayed away from Abraham. He feel I'm a big boy. You know, that's what some people used to do. He dried up. You will not dry up. Oh. He dried up. Everything he has was burnt with fire. Wife turned to pillar of salt. It dried up. Hallelujah. But Abraham was still getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Because that's the actual concentration of the blessing. So when you see things working for you, you have to understand this principle. But that's just by the way, that's what we are looking at. So Abraham built an altar unto the Lord in chapter 12, isn't it? When the Lord appeared to Abraham, he made an altar. So look at chapter 13 verse 4. And unto the place of the altar which he had made there first, and Abraham called on the name of the Lord. Chapter 13 verse 4. Chapter 13 verse 1 was telling us how Abraham was rich in cattle, rich in silver, rich in gold. Amen. If you have gold today, you are a big man. Abraham had it then. So you see, he's a bigger man. Praise God. He has silver, he has gold, he has cattle. Some people don't have chicken. He has all of that. And he was still seeking God in verse 4. He was still praying. When some people have 200,000 in their account, they won't do quiet time again. No quiet? Eh? What is quiet time? That's why, that's why, you know, God at times is checking us out that if I give this boy money, will he not turn against me? The devil is the one that can give a man money and he does not need to ask that question because before he gives you the money, he has already taken what will make you come back to him. Because God will not force you. He just wants your heart to align. And so Abraham was always building an altar. There is a constant communication between him and heaven. Hallelujah. And so you see that Abraham was always doing that. And by the time we got to chapter 24, you discover that God has blessed him in all things. So my number one point of becoming great using God's method is build an altar. Build what? Build an altar. What is an altar? An altar is where our life is altered. What is an altar? An altar is the communication point between the divine and the woman. What is an altar? An altar is where we get divine idea, divine wisdom, divine understanding of what to execute upon the earth. What is an altar? An altar is where we get divine instruction so that we can avoid earthly destruction. What is an altar? An altar is where we create force, the physical thing. That was created in the spiritual realm is on the altar. The altar is a place that you cannot compromise to have if you are going to become great in God. Amen. Many people like to become great without God. That was what the first set of men were doing. They were trying to achieve something great without God. And that's how a lot of people live their life. They want to blow, but they don't want Jesus inside it. Praise God. They don't want Jesus inside it. And Jesus does not want you to serve him because you want to blow. He wants you to follow him because you love him. It is out of loving him that every other thing will come out. Amen. So there is need for an altar. If we are going to ask you, where is your altar? 
Do you have a one-on-one session with God regularly? I'm not talking about a seminar. I'm talking about one-on-one session. You and God alone. One-on-one with God. Is it consistent? You know, this is like everybody talking to God at the same time. But a one-on-one session is just you and God. It's needed. It's important. Praise God. So, that's going to be my number one point. My number two point is going to be obedience. So, God said, Abraham, come out. Abraham did not start saying, where am I going to, sir? He said, I will show you. I will take you to the land flowing with me and honey. He didn't say, how can I be going without a map? Do you want to destroy my life? I have only one. I should just be going. And one day I will just go. And one animal will come and kill me. I'm not going. Tell me where I'm going. Praise God. So let's go to chapter 12 verse 1. Now the Lord has said to Abraham, Get thee out of thy country and thy kindred and thy father's house unto a land that I will show you. He does not even have map. Unto a land that I will do what? I will show you. No map. Just be going. I'm your map. I'm your what? I'm your map. Obedience. What are the things that God tells you to do? Obedience brings you, if if you are willing and obedient, you are the people that will eat the fruit of the land. Obedience brings you into God's plan for your life. It brings you into greatness. God told the children of Israel, leave Egypt to. I'm taking you to a land flowing with milk and honey. He said, if you will obey me, you are going to possess the land. They doubted by disobedience. And what happened? They perished in the wilderness. Obedience, very critical. And you see, if you go through the Bible, the Bible told us several things to obey. Obey the word of God. Obey them that have rule over you. Obey the word of Christ. Obey the um, um, obey the magistrate and the courts. The Bible stated different things that we are to obey. How is your obedience life? When last can you say, I obey? When I am driving and I see people join on red light because police is not there, I know that there is something faulty inside them and it is related to disobedience. If they can disobey traffic lights, they are not obeying God. There is a portion of their life where they are not obeying God. There is a scripture that says, until your obedience is complete, there are some things God will not do. He taught it not to be equal with God. He was obedient to the death of the cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him. So obedience cannot be set aside and lifting will appear. Say, God will lift me up by mercy. I know. I know God will lift you up by mercy. Obey. Praise God. Do what? Obey. Let's go to Philippians chapter 2. How is your obedience life? When last did God speak to you? Some people, it is difficult to talk to them. Your parents talk to you. Your pastor talk to you. They tell you to do simple things. Philippians chapter 2. But it is always an issue. Philippians chapter 2. Verse, I want us to see verse uh, 8. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even to the death of the cross. Wherefore, God has highly exalted him. I want you to look at that. Highly exalted. Exalt is already exalted. 
Praise God. But when you now say highly exalted, it comes through obedience. The Bible says he humbled himself. He became obedient. Proud people cannot be obedient. You cannot say you are obedient and you are proud. Praise God. And what makes people to be proud? Achievements. Things makes people to be proud. Say, oh, can't you see I have money? Can't you see I have car? Can't you see I have a big business? Can't you see I'm old? Things makes people to be proud. When you are proud, you can never be obedient. You need humility to be obedient. Humility is the other side of the coin of obedience. And when you are going to become great in God, in resources, spiritually, in things, you have to live a life of consistent obedience. Obedience that an unbeliever will look at you and say, you are a fool. If your obedience has not gotten to that level, then you are not obedient. Praise God. An obedience that an unbeliever will say and say, ah, what has your pastor given you to eat? Has he given you that thing they normally give other people? You don't even know what you are doing again. Praise God. Obedience. Obedience. Thank God Philippians chapter 7 and 8 is in the Bible. Assuming God tells somebody to do that. To go and die. And he say, I want to become obedient to death. You will see several people quoting Bible for you. The Bible says you shall not die. You will live. Praise God. When Jesus was telling the disciples, the son of man will die. And he will rise again. Peter called him aside. You know Peter was older than Jesus. He said, say after me. I shall not die. I shall live. I shall declare the work of the Lord. How can you say you will die? You will not die. Stop saying that. Praise God. He said, no, you cannot die. And Jesus looked at him. He said, devil, get out. He didn't say Peter devil. He just said devil straight away. Obedience. The devil will do everything. He will quote Bible to you. And he will give you reason why you should not obey God. I pray. May you be baptized with the spirit of obedience. The children of Israel lost what they supposed to have because of disobedience. Lot was like the son of who? Abraham. And then there was confusion between the horsemen of Abraham and Lot. What does Lot supposed to do? He's supposed to say, ah, daddy, I don't know why those people are fighting, but I've told my boys they should never strive with your boys. You don't know that it's my uncle. It's my daddy. And you are going, in fact, all of you, I sack you. He separated. He said, I, I need my boys to, to, to be doing their own thing. How, how can they be oppressing my boys? Pride dries a man's up. Amen. That was what dried the devil up. The Bible says he exalted himself. He said, I'm going to lift up myself and then set my throne. That's what pride does. So, but when you are obedient, it gets you into what God asks for your life. The abundance that God asks for your life. So, the first one is what? Build an altar. The second one is what? Obedience. But what I'm trying to do is that I'm trying to make sure that I join um, I join Humility with obedience in that point. And number three, move a divine instruction. What should you do? Move a divine instruction. Hallelujah. That's going to be the last point. If you don't have an altar, you cannot move at any instruction. If you are not ready to obey God, God will not speak to you. 
The Bible says, if they come and ask me anything, according, I'm paraphrasing now, I'm going to answer them according to the idols of their heart. So when you go to God with an answer in your mind, you want to marry brother Kenny, and you are praying, Father, who should I marry? I love brother Kenny. Jesus, you need to show me the way. When God is showing you the way, we show you brother Kenny. There's nothing you can do about it. You can't set an idol in your heart and expect God to speak to you. So when, when you have an altar and your heart is showing obedience, it is easy for God to speak to you and say, okay, move in this direction. And you move. Why is this point important? And of course, this is going to be my last point. Why is this point important? It's important because God spoke to Abraham. Go take your only son Isaac. Amen. Take your only son who? Maybe we should just read that place. Take your only son Isaac. Go and sacrifice him unto me. Maliabako shalabakata. God will increase you. In the name of Jesus. Okay. I'm trying to pull that scripture. That should be chapter chapter 22 now. And it came to pass after this thing that God did tempt Abraham. Now that's 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 not the actual Hebrew word. It's a synonym. Okay? God cannot tempt a man of evil. Okay? And it came to pass afterward that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, I'm here. Here I'm her. Here I am. Verse 2. And he said, Take now thy son, thy only son, Isaac, whom thou lovest, not the one you don't love, and give thee, in, and get thee into the land of Moriah. And offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. Praise God. Sacrifice. Everybody say sacrifice. And when Abraham got there, the voice of the Lord came to him. Because the voice of the Lord is not strange to him. So you must, what's the third point now? What's the third point? You must move at divine speed. Abraham didn't say, God told me to kill him. I have to kill him. Mm -mm. The instruction at the moment is what Abraham is following. Moving at divine speed. Moving at divine speed. But when you don't have an altar, you will not even understand God's voice. You will not even be willing to be obedient. But when you are having an altar, you are willing to be obedient, God is going to speak to you. And when he speaks to you, you know the next step to take. Praise God. If God there, God said, don't touch that boy. Let us assume he doesn't hear God again. He will have killed the boy, isn't it? You have to move at divine speed. You have to move at divine instruction. When Moses was called out by God, God never told him, you will face the Red Sea. He got to the Red Sea and God said, lift up your rod. And the Red Sea parted into two. When God is going to make a man great, in summary now, is going to start with you small, inconsequential, something that men will despise, something that people will overlook, something that men will disregard, something that men will not think about, something that men will we just do away with. Praise God. I was listening yesterday to a message, and that preacher said, and I say those things and you pray.